first of all, I deal with the name. The name is Fred the Hammer Williamson. Chicago, Gary, Indiana, Northwestern University. Uh, Ten years of pro football, Oakland Raiders, Kansas City Chiefs, all pro. A couple of Super Bowls. And thus, henceforth, here we are. I'm an architect by trade. I, I went to Northwestern and graduated as an architectural engineer. So when I stopped, when I graduated from college, I had been drafted by the 49ers. And I said, that's a good opportunity for me to go to California and, and, and do my architecture since California is a very versatile state. So I figured I could do some really wild architecture there. But once I stopped playing football and I was doing architecture, I was working for Bechtel Steel. I was chief architect for Bechtel Steel in San Francisco during off season when I was playing ball. Once I stopped playing ball, I couldn't make that transition. Uh, nine to five, one hour for lunch was just not my cup of tea. So one night I was looking for something to do. I says, I can't sell cars, I can't sell insurance. I says, let me find something to do. And I, and I saw Julia's show. Diane Kale had a show called Julia. So I think I'll go to Hollywood and become Diane Kale's boyfriend on the Julia show. So I packed up my, my Jaguar, my XKE, and hooked it onto a trailer and drove to, to Hollywood. And uh, I went to 20th Century Fox lot and I said, I'd like to see Mr. Hal Cantor. And they said, do you have an appointment? I said, no. I said, you can't come on the lot. He says, fine. I drove around the corner, picked up the phone, called the gate, said, this is Mr. Cantor's office. We expect you, Mr. Williamson. Will you let him on the lot, please? Drove back around. He says, oh, yes, Mr. Williamson, we're expecting you. So I went in and I talked to the secretary and I said, I have a, uh, can I see you, Mr. Cantor? And she says, well, who's, who's here? I said, just tell him the hammer is in the house. So she got on a squawk box and she says, uh, Mr. Hal Cantor, uh, Mr. Hammer is here. I says, no, not Mr. Hammer, the hammer. And there was a silence and he says, uh, football player? I says, yeah. So we go in, we talk 15 minutes on football and I said, listen, man, I'm, you know, I've seen your show. All your guest stars are the black guys. The black guy each week is a different black guy playing Diane Kill's boyfriend. I said, now that that gives us a dubious, that gives her a very dubious reputation that she's dating a different guy every week. What you need is a regular. And he says, well, your timing is right because we've been getting a little pressure from NAACP and CORE and that very thing. And I said, well, I'm your man. You know, I mean, and now these guys are better looking than me. So I'm your man. So he said, okay, uh, have you ever acted before? I said, yeah, man, I did five years of Carmen Jones and Raising the Sun in Canada. If you had asked me what character I played, I'd have, I would not have been dead in the, in the water because I <laughs> wouldn't name anybody. And I took him to Canada because if I had said New York, he'd have said, well, what company and where and all this. So I didn't. So he went along with the program. He said, okay, I'll write you a, a script for the show. And it's called Dancer in the Dark. It's about a pro football player who just retired from pro football and came to work for the same company that Dan Kell worked for. We meet, we fall in love, and we establish a relationship. So I did three years on Julia. Timing, being at the right place is everything. We shot at 20th Century Fox a lot. I'm in the commissary one day. Guy walks by and he says, you're the hammer, right? I says, yeah. He says, well, we're doing a, a movie and has a football scene in it. And I don't know anything about football. Would you, would you do, be in the movie, handle all the football stuff, and give you a nice role? I said, okay. The movie was MASH, Robert Altman. Hi, Trash. Long time no see. Why'd you do it, Olga? We had a deal. When I came to Hollywood, I knew what I wanted to be. I knew the image that I wanted to project because it was an image that I, I, could, I could perpetuate from being the hammer, something I could sell, the action guy. Uh, really, I wanted to do the, the James Bond guy is what I was really after. I had convinced Universal to do that, so we made a film called That Man Bolt. It was actually the first black James Bond kind of movie because we shot it in Hong Kong, we shot it in LA. But I was so far ahead of my time. This was like 71. I mean, I was so far ahead of my time that black wasn't in then. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of black actors around that, were, that had these kind of roles, that had starring roles, and you know, my, my, my co-stars were all white, and so I was too far ahead of my time. And so. They signed me to a three three picture deal and they didn't know what to come back on the second picture, so they just paid me off. They just paid me off and I said, that's fine because I had three rules when I came to Hollywood. One, you can't kill me. Three, I have to, two, I have to win all my fights. And three, I get the girl at the end of the movie if I want her. 
Hollywood wasn't ready for that. So I said, okay, then I have to make my own movies because I want to be the hero. You, you know, if you, you can't kill me and have Schwarzenegger avenge my death, kill Schwarzenegger, let me avenge his death. But that's not where they were, and so I, you know, I started making my own movies. And once I started doing that, then I was in a position to, to decide what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. I'm a stand-up guy, and I will always be a stand-up guy because I know what I represent to black people and to the black race because I came up in the 70s when there were no heroes. So I became a hero because heroes were needed at the time. Um, and they were still, they were still uh, arresting people on the street, black people on the street, hosing them down, getting them off the street in the 60s and 70s. That was still happening in the early 70s when we were making our movies. So we needed some stand-up people in Hollywood. It wasn't, my films were not about Get Whitey. My films were when the smoke cleared, I was the only one left standing. So I killed black people, yellow people, white people, pink people. I was an equal opportunity killer, okay? But I was a stand-up guy, and that's what was needed. That's why my career has, has, has lasted. Uh, Jim Brown was the same kind of guy. Roundtree was the same kind of guy. We came along at the time when black needed that kind of strength on the screen. So that's my responsibility. My responsibility is to always be me and be the kind of person that they think that I am and maybe the kind of person that they think that I am may coincidentally coincide with the kind of person that I may be. You come sneaking into my kingdom like a thief. You kill one of my best men. You say you didn't do it? You hear that which trash tells lies. I'm never without this cigar, dude. It wasn't their idea. I'm never without this. You see me in any of my movies. This was my prop. Long before cigar smoking became popular by the non-smoking peons who now smoke cigars, the hammer always had a cigar. I have my own plantation in Jamaica. I have a, I have a, a hacienda there. I have four little white people working for me, rolling cigars for me, and they send me a supply every month and I do my own cigars. You can't buy any cigar this long and this slender. This is my trademark, a long, slender cigar. Not these fat suckers, these guys sticking in their mouth trying to, trying to emulate the hammer. That ain't happening because they can't find these suckers. I don't want anybody smoking my stuff. I don't want anybody smoking my stuff, man. I'm, <laughs> I don't want anybody wearing the same clothes I wear, dude. If I see a guy with my jacket on, I take it off and throw it in the street. <laughs> you know, I'm that kind of guy, man. The movie I did was, was uh, Adios Amigo. No Way Back was three in a row. Adios Amigo, No Way Back, and Mean Johnny Barrows. I went and raised the money uh, myself and, and produced and wrote and directed those films. I had an idea, I had a concept. You know, I knew that my films were, were marketable worldwide because of all the girlfriends that I had. I had Italian, French. But what happened was when we did films like Black Caesar and, and Hell Up in Harlem, Bucktown, they were being sold abroad at $3,000 a piece. No matter who was in the film, if it was a black film, had a black star, it was sold for $3,000. And I said, this, this is not, that's not right. There's no way, man. I mean, I'm, I know better than that. I mean, my, my girlfriends, I got more girlfriends than that. So you're going to tell me that my film is no, not worth more than 3000 So what I did in 1975 when I made No Way Back and Adios Amigo, I took these films under my arm and went to the Cannes Film Festival. So I went to Cannes and sold my own films, my first four or five films that I made. I personally sold them. I gave the maitre d' a tip every day at Cannes at the Carlton Terrace, and I sit on the terrace, and my office was the Carlton Terrace. I had chicks running around in, in, in T-shirts with the, with the movie title on the front. And I sold my first picture to Greece, who came and said, Williamson, oh, 3,000. I said, there's no way, man. Forget about it. You'll never get another Fred Williamson movie for that. So he came back the very last day, and we made a deal for 25,000. So my first film was No Way Back. I made for 75,000, and I brought back over $300,000 from sales. So based on that understanding of how the European community felt about me, then I made an effort to, uh, to pick a city that I liked and that I think I would like, which was Rome. So I moved to Rome.